Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Torsellini, and in this episode, we'll be continuing our discussion of occupant comfort and the properties of moist air. This episode will walk through the basics of how to read a psychometric chart, which is a key design tool for architects, engineers, and builders to help deliver comfortable buildings for their occupants. Let's remind ourselves of the definition of psychometrics which is fundamentally the science of the air-water mixture we discussed in our previous episode, and the study of the properties of air at different temperatures and humidity levels. By understanding psychometrics, we can deliver the comfort zone and develop building design strategies for creating an indoor environment that stays within that comfort zone as much as possible. A psychometric chart is how most of us interface with this topic. The chart, shown here, is a graph of the various parameters of moist air at a constant pressure, often equated to an elevation above sea level. Why is that important? The amount of water that can go from liquid to gas is highly dependent on the pressure of the gas. As the elevation above sea level increases, there is less atmosphere. Therefore, the amount of air pushing down on the Earth's surface is less. Less atmosphere means lower air pressure, and therefore it is easier for the water to go from a liquid to a gaseous state. We also see this in terms of the temperature it takes for water to boil. At sea level, this temperature is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and in places like Denver, Colorado, that happens to be around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. When using a psychometric chart for designing a building, be sure that you're using the right chart for the elevation above sea level. Now back to the chart. You can see there's a lot going on in this chart and there are a few key terms we need to define. Think of this plot as a typical XY plot. To understand the relationships between the various properties, we need to start with two measurements. First is the dry bulb temperature, which is shown horizontally on the x-axis and indicated by vertical green lines. Dry bulb temperature refers to the ambient air temperature without any influence of moisture or wind speed. This is the temperature measurement done by most thermometers and thermostats. On the y-axis, we have the humidity ratio. This is a mass ratio that represents the actual amount of water in the air, and it's expressed in terms of the mass of the water per mass of dry air. We'll come back to this term later in the episode. The next term we're going to discuss is the wet bulb temperature, shown as diagonal blue lines here. Think of wet bulb temperature as an expression of how cool the air can become through evaporative cooling. It's determined by wrapping a thermometer's bulb in a wet cloth and then measuring the temperature as water evaporates from the cloth. When water evaporates, it absorbs heat energy from the surrounding air, causing a cooling effect. With the wet bulb temperature, we can determine humidity levels. When the difference between dry bulb temperature and wet bulb temperature is large, this means that water is evaporating quickly and the air surrounding the thermometer is drier, i.e. lower humidity. As humidity increases, the wet bulb temperature approaches the dry bulb temperature because higher humidity slows evaporative cooling from the wet cloth. What happens when humidity gets so high that evaporative cooling of the wet bulb stops and the wet bulb temperature is equal to the dry bulb temperature. This is known as the air's dew point or saturation temperature, which we'll explain more on the next slide. So one thing you might notice right away with this chart is that it seems to be missing the upper left portion. Why is it cut off on this curved edge? This edge of the chart is known as the saturation line. At a given temperature, air can only hold a certain amount of moisture in the form of water vapor before it becomes fully saturated and the water vapor condenses out of the air into liquid water. Let's illustrate this by plotting a point on the chart. If we look at a dry bulb temperature of 25 degrees C and follow that line up to the saturation curve, we can learn a few things. 
First, you can see that the 25 degree dry bulb and wet bulb temperature lines intersect at this point, which we described a moment ago. Second, being at the saturation curve means that the air cannot hold any more water vapor at this temperature. In other words, the air is holding 100% of the water vapor it can possibly hold. This is known as the relative humidity of the air, depicted here by curved red lines. Now we can also answer the question of how much water vapor is actually in the air at the saturation point. Looking horizontally to the right at the y-axis, we find the absolute humidity or humidity ratio expressed here as a mass ratio of water to air. At the point we've plotted, this value is approximately 0 0.020 grams of water per gram of dry air. If we go down to 50% relative humidity, we see the humidity ratio is cut in half to 0 0.010 grams of water per gram of dry air. And we can see from the overall upward curve of this chart that as dry bulb temperature increases, the amount of water vapor that can be present in the air also increases. Basically, warmer air can hold more moisture. This is one of the most important concepts you should take from this episode. So we've introduced some key terms on this chart, dry bulb and wet bulb temperature, saturation temperature or dew point, relative humidity, and absolute humidity ratio. But there are a few others that we should point out. First is enthalpy, shown here as black diagonal lines and is expressed as joules per gram of dry air. This is a measure of the energy content in the air when taking into account temperature and humidity. Enthalpy is a useful concept to understand when designing heating and cooling systems for a building, but it's a complex topic that is beyond the scope of this course. Second is specific volume, shown as diagonal green lines and expressed as cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. Think of this as being the amount of space occupied by a kilogram of air at a given temperature and humidity. In other words, specific volume is the inverse of density. Now let's look at a software tool that lets us plot weather data on a psychometric chart. This particular tool is Climate Consultant. There are numerous tools that can do this sort of analysis. In this example, we've imported a weather file for New York City, which contains 8760 data points of temperature and humidity representing every hour in a year. The points plotted on this chart are color-coded based on the ranges of the dry bulb temperature as shown in the legend at the top left of the chart. The next thing this tool allows us to do is overlay a box on the chart that outlines the comfort zone. It's important to note that there are several comfort models that have been developed using rigorous research and sampling of how comfortable people feel at different temperatures and humidity ratios. The one we've chosen is shown here is based on ASHRAE Standard 55 where they've taken into account different clothing typically worn in the summer and in the winter. The left box represents the comfort zone when wearing winter clothing, and the right box represents the comfort zone when wearing summer clothing. Every data point inside these boxes indicates outside air conditions that would generally be considered comfortable, while data points outside these boxes would feel uncomfortable, either too hot, too cold, or too humid. The tool actually provides a nice metric for this, showing 11% of all the hours in a year are within the comfort box. The other 89% of the year, the red data points, is outside the comfort box. And in order to make the indoor environment comfortable during these uncomfortable outdoor conditions, certain processes need to occur. These include active processes with mechanical systems like air conditioning, heating, mechanical heating, humidification or dehumidification. There is also passive processes like natural ventilation, solar heat gains, or shading of windows. We will discuss each of these in more detail later in the course. Let's go back to our earlier discussion of what makes us feel comfortable or uncomfortable. And this time we'll use the psychometric chart to help illustrate these concepts. As humans generate heat, it needs to transfer away from our bodies in order to prevent overheating. 
The problem is we either end up feeling cold if the air is too cold and this body heat dissipates too quickly, or we end up feeling warm if the air is too warm or humid and body heat doesn't dissipate quickly enough. As you can see here, data points to the left of the comfort box below about 20 degrees Celsius feel too cold and temperatures to the right above about 28 degrees Celsius feel too warm. And we also see that data points with humidity ratios above 0.012 feel uncomfortable, regardless of temperature. But that doesn't leave us with a rectangular box for the comfort zone. The blue box is slanted to the left, illustrating how comfort is dependent on humidity. Putting this simply, we are able to tolerate warmer temperatures at lower levels of humidity because of the way our bodies use sweat and evaporative cooling to remove heat. Moisture on our skin is able to evaporate easily when there is less moisture in the air. But when humidity levels are higher and there is more moisture in the air, sweat doesn't evaporate as easily and our bodies can't remove heat as effectively. So with higher humidity, we need the temperature to be a little lower to feel comfortable, hence the comfort box slanted to the left. And looking at the left side of the comfort box, we see that we can tolerate lower temperatures with higher humidity. As humidity increases, the moisture content in the air can help slow the evaporative cooling effect on our bodies and allow us to feel more comfortable with lower temperatures. Now let's look at an example. If you plot a point at 30 degrees Celsius, or about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and 0.02 grams of water per gram of dry air, we land here. The point we plotted is near the 75% relative humidity line. This means that at this temperature and absolute humidity, measured at sea level, the air is holding 75% of the total amount of moisture it can possibly hold. Or, in other words, it's 75% of the way to the saturation point. Now, if we roughly outline the comfort zone on this chart, we can see that our data point is up in the hot, humid zone. How do we take these air conditions and make it comfortable inside the building? In other words, how do we bring it into the comfort zone? Well, you can't just move the X from here to there. We need to cool the air and dehumidify it first. And the laws of thermodynamics require us to take a certain path. First, we go to the left, cooling the air until we hit the saturation line, meaning that this temperature, about 25 degrees C, water begins to condense out of the air into liquid form. Examples of this include water droplets forming on the outside of a glass of cold water or dew forming on the grass. In both of these cases, the object's temperature is at the dew point. As we cool even further to point three, we can't move horizontally to the left anymore. We have to travel down the saturation curve, and the humidity ratio decreases along with the temperature. So at this point, we can see that cooling the air from one to two to three, the temperature has gone from 30 degrees C to 10 degrees C, and the humidity ratio has gone from 0.02 grams of water per gram of dry air to about 0.07 grams of water per gram of dry air. Now we've dehumidified the air by cooling it down to the point that water is actually removed from the air by condensing it into liquid form. This is how most dehumidification processes need to work, and they result with air being dehumidified, but usually uncomfortably cold at point three. So the fourth step would be a reheat process to heat the air back to a comfortable temperature, moving it horizontally to the right on this chart. To get from 30 degrees C and 75% relative humidity to a more comfortable 23 degrees C and 45% humidity, we had to cool, dehumidify, and then reheat the air. This is just one example, but hopefully it helps demonstrate how HVAC processes occur to cool and dehumidify the air.
Oh, and one more thing. I want to acknowledge that the psychometric charts we've used in this episode are expressed in SI or metric units. But in the United States, it's more common to use English units. We've provided a table here to show the terms from the psychometric chart in both systems of units. Note that absolute and relative humidity are expressed as ratios or percentages. So the values are the same whether you're using metric or English units. There is one notable exception. Sometimes in the English unit system, absolute humidity is measured in terms of grains of moisture per pound of dry air, or simply grains for short. There are 7,000 grains in a pound. For example, if the humidity ratio is 0.01 with either set of units, then it equates to 70 grains of moisture and the pounds of dry air are inferred. You can easily find psychometric chart for either system of measurement. We've just started to scratch the surface on the relationship of temperature, humidity, and the impacts of our perceptions of comfort. That's all we'll cover on this topic for now, but here are a few things we didn't cover that I encourage you to explore further on your own if you're interested. The laws of thermodynamics are covered more in detail in Module 3. This information is important for your understanding of heat transfer, both for thermal comfort and for building performance. Psychometrics is a powerful tool to help design HVAC systems to effectively make the building comfortable. The processes of heating, cooling, humidification, and dehumidification can all be shown on the chart. This becomes a design tool for better buildings. As you learn more about building design strategies, it is an important topic to explore further. These processes are used in the design and operation of HVAC systems are incredibly intertwined and their relationships are captured concisely in the psychometric chart. A key goal for buildings is to keep occupants comfortable. The envelope of the building is the first line of defense and an effective envelope design is key. What the envelope cannot accomplish is left to the HVAC system, but that takes energy and we're trying to minimize the energy impact of buildings. As we look at designing buildings, we cover these topics in later episodes. We also did not discuss how temperature and humidity affects your building, in addition to occupant comfort. Mold growth is a risk when humidity levels remain high for too long. A general rule of thumb is to keep indoor relative humidity below 60% to prevent mold growth. But there is more complexity to this, so I encourage you to explore on your own. As always, thanks for watching. Let us know if you have any questions or comments about the topics we've covered here.